Hello everyone and welcome back to Tower Gate. It is Tower Gate day number 1,200. 1,200. I guess we've reached another milestone. 1,200 days. Or that's not 1,200 days, that's 1,200 Tower Gate videos. That's a lot of videos. <laughs> so anyway, it's uh, Friday, July the 24th, 2020. Thank you so much for tuning in. We're going to go ahead and uh, continue on with where we left off the last uh, three days or so. Uh, covering this um, so-called uh, interview of the so-called uh, primary subsource of Christopher Steele, if you believe that. <clears throat> before I get into that, we do have one important piece of breaking news, Spygate related. But before I tell you this, uh, I was over at my mom's earlier today after I got off work, I stopped by and you know she was telling me, she said, you know, I I just worry that, uh, you know, Durham or Barr or whatever are not going to come out and do anything before the election. And, and uh, that worries me because I, everybody needs to know what happened, you know, in 2016. They need to know that when they vote in 2020. It's really important. And I'm just worried that, uh, you know, Durham and Barr's, they're not going to do anything until, you know, after the election. And what happens if, if Biden wins and the whole thing will be swept under the rug? Of course, I said, yeah, Mom, I know I hear that a lot. Uh, I, too, have that kind of, that concern to some degree, but I said, um, you know, my thoughts are, as I kind of pointed out in one of my videos uh, three or four months ago, when we really started getting a lot of serious document drops, and uh, if I remember what I said in that video is that th this is not an accident. Uh, Barr and Durham would not be dropping all this incredibly damning evidence, the actual evidence that would get you convicted in court. They would not be dropping all this evidence if they did not intend to bring charges. And Barr in Durham, uh, Barr was already interviewed and said, well, you know, the election doesn't, you know, have any impact on the investigation unless one of the two candidates are involved, which they're not. You know, Biden and Trump are not on the, uh, are not, uh, you know, part of the investigation. <clears throat> So Durham's investigation will go on regardless, and uh, you know we've heard from various people, including uh, Barr's spokesperson, uh, in the last week or so, that um, they're pretty sure that uh, there is going to be uh, something that's going to happen before the election regarding uh, telling us what happened, some indictments, whatever. So uh, that's my take on it. Um, it has been my take on it for quite some time. That's why I'm confident that we're certainly going to uh, get to the bottom of this. I think uh, there'll be two to three dozen indictments of the uh, coup plotters. I don't know that they'll all be indicted before the election. I think what will most likely happen is that uh, they'll come out with some sort of a general statement. Uh, they'll make a general statement about what the investigation has uncovered at this point. And I think that they'll probably have some plea deals already at that point, and I think that they'll announce those guilty pleas, individuals who've pled guilty. Uh, they may or may not have some indictments of some of the others, but I think that there will be some form of uh, people indicted, likely people who are pleading guilty right now as we speak uh, to their crimes and who will be giving up information on other people later. So I think that's probably what we're looking at. I could be wrong, but that's what I'm looking at. But in general, uh, as I told my mom, I don't really understand the, the uh, strategy uh, of Attorney General Barr to leak literally smoking gun, I don't love the term, but smoking gun, highly incriminating evidence that taken into a court of law would get you convicted. And this not just been one or two or three or five documents. Uh, Barr in the last three to four months has approved the release of dozens uh, of documents that are taken into a court of law will get you convicted of the crime. I mean, it's, it's right there. So, I mean, just the last release of Peter's been stroking us is personal handwritten notes. Not only does it, you know, embarrass the New York Times and prove that they were lying, but what it really does is it incriminates Peter's been stroking us, Luce Lisa Page, and uh, Andy McCabe, as well, along with Prestep. Uh, it literally incriminates all those four because it shows that at the time when Strzok wrote that those notes, uh, which was in February, Valentine's Day to be exact, uh, when he wrote those notes, February 14th of 2017, 
uh, this was before he went over and joined the Mueller team along with uh, Loose Lisa Page. So they knew, you know, let's see, February, let's see, March, April, they knew three months before they joined the Mueller team that there was no evidence of any of the things that they went over to the Mueller team to investigate. And, of course, because Bill Priestep and um, Andy McCabe were CC'd on that, uh, on that email, uh, they knew it as well. So that's just one example. There's many. So, yes, uh, Attorney General Barr would not be releasing all these documents showing really hardcore evidence that when taken into court are slam dunks for convictions. Right now, these documents are probably being used to get guilty pleas. <laughs> and uh, guilty pleas uh, usually come along with meaning you have to cooperate. Uh, you plead guilty will lessen your charges if you will agree to tell us everything you know. That's how that works. And I think that a lot of that is going on right now behind the scenes. So yes, I do believe <clears throat> that before the election, somewhere probably around Labor Day weekend, uh, we'll get some sort of a pre preliminary report to tell us where the investigation is and what they've learned so far. And I think they'll probably release uh, the names of various people who have already pled guilty, uh, made plea deals. And uh, I think then they'll say that the investigation uh, is continuing on and uh, I think that that's probably what we're going to get. Uh, could be something bigger than that, but I think that that's at least what we'll get. What I don't think is going to happen is that we're going to get nothing before the election. I think Barr and Durham understand exactly what we all understand. Uh, they're not stupid men. And the election has no bearing on John Durham's investigation. Uh, he's, a, you know, he's not going to pause his investigation or not indict or whatever. On the other hand, I don't think that they would go forward and release any information if Durham wasn't ready. I think you just tell Barr, I'm, I, you know, I'm sorry, but I'm just not ready. Um, but I think that they are ready, uh, probably will be ready by Labor Day to announce uh, at least ways their findings up to this point where they are in the investigation. And I think that they'll by then, and I think that's why we're hearing that they're, that they're negotiating right now uh, with plea deals because I think that they want to get a few solid plea deals done before Labor Day. And I expect that uh, they'll do that and we'll get the names of those people. And there's quite a few people I can think of who they would be able to get plea deals out of, <clears throat> especially when you look at some of the charges they're facing. Uh, one of them would be, of course, Kevin Kleinsmith. I think Joe Pientka is uh, in that group. I think Peter's been stroking us is in that group. Uh, I certainly think that um, this um, intelligence uh, analyst, Mr. Alton, Brian Alton is in that group. I think Stephen Soma is in that group. He's the one who Horowitz said made what, 39 factual errors? So I think there's probably a half a dozen to a dozen guys in there in that mid to upper level uh, who are going to uh, cop plea deals before Labor Day. And I think that that's probably what we're going to see first. I think the real big fish come after Trump wins big, wins big in November. Now let's talk about the latest release. And these are going to continue. And they're going to get even more and more damning because, again, as I explained in a previous video, uh, Barr understands exactly how the media and the left are going to play it when he starts dropping charges on people. And as I said months ago, it's not so much whether to indict or who to indict. Uh, it's, it's how to indict. It's how to do this. How do you do this? Because the Democrats and their friends in the media will turn this country inside out if they have to. And that's exactly what they'll do. Barr knows that. He knows what's coming. So... I think that what his strategy is, is to begin the release of some very damning evidence and to continue releasing more and more and more damning evidence so that by the time he does come out and file a report and start uh, laying indictments and getting guilty pleas and things and such, uh, by that time, there'll be so much inc incriminating hardcore evidence out in the public domain that people won't be questioning you know, or surprised when the indictments fall. They'll be expecting it, quite honestly, because when you have this much damning evidence, people know something's coming. Uh, on the other hand, Barr and Durham would not throw out all this evidence because they, be, they could be, you know, holding on to all this. They don't have to release any of this stuff. But um, I don't think that they would release all this damning evidence, put it out in the public domain and say, okay, well, there it is. There is the evidence of all the crimes uh, that were committed, hardcore evidence could be taken into court and prosecuted easily. Um, we're going to go ahead and throw all this evidence out there, and then we're not going to really do anything. 
I don't think so. I don't think so. That's not how it works. Barr is smarter than that. These leaks have been coming, and they are going to continue to come. And they're not leaks. They are releases by Attorney General Barr. These are releases, and they're being released in a very systematic manner. We're getting one, two releases every week that are very, very damning. These are really critical pieces of evidence that normally you, we wouldn't see this stuff. So this is the type of stuff you normally wouldn't see released. It's being released for a reason. And I just told you what the reason is. And we're going to see a lot more of it uh, coming up to Labor Day. And so by the time we get to somewhere in that period, maybe the week before, the week after Labor Day, um, I think at that point they will have released so much damning evidence. And I expect every document will be, will be even more damning than the one before. They're just going to keep releasing more and more damning evidence until it's so overwhelming uh, that um, when the indictments come down, no one will be surprised. It'll be exactly what everyone was expecting. And uh, that doesn't mean the left isn't going to react the way they're going to react, but I think that the DOJ is probably preparing for, uh, you know, riots and various other things. But the fact of the matter is, uh, yes, I do think that, as I told my mom, that uh, I think that uh, you can sleep well at night because I do believe that this is what we're going to see before Labor Day. <clears throat> now let's go ahead and get on to the latest release of very, very damning evidence. Very damning evidence. Yesterday, John Ratcliffe released an August 2016 memo which details the FBI's use of an agent to provide a counterintelligence briefing to Donald Trump and Michael Flynn in order to collect evidence for the Russia probe. These notes were taken by Joe Pienka, who was targeting Flynn. Pienka told the Inspector General Huckleberry Horowitz that he saw the briefing as an opportunity to gain assessment and possibly have some level of familiarity with Flynn. So, should we get to the point where we need to do a subject interview, I would have that to fall back on. <laughs> well, that's probably wasn't good, but you know, at least he's honest. Not real smart, but at least he's honest. So there you go. There's Joe Pienka telling Inspector General Huckleberry Horowitz. It was in the IG report. We all heard about it. We all read about it. And that was just another one of them things. It was like, wow, that's damning evidence. So now John Ratcliffe has released the actual uh, document, the memo uh, that, that Joe Pienka wrote, where he basically admits exactly what they're doing. They're going to go on over and interview Trump and Flynn. This was supposed to be a counterintelligence briefing that you would regularly get if you're the president or one of the people running for president. Hillary Clinton got hers on August the 27th. Now, they didn't try to entrap her. Uh, what they were doing, as you can hear from Joe Pienka telling Inspector General Huckleberry Horowitz, is they wanted to size up General Flynn and see if Trump said anything that they could use. So. Uh, and the reason why we know this was part of the coup plot is because it was in the Crossfire Hurricane Files. It was in the Crossfire Hurricane Files. They went over there as part of the Crossfire Hurricane operation. In fact, it was actually the other Crossfire, whatever it was, the one on Flynn. It was actually what file they found it in. Um, so they went there to try to get information uh, to try to size up Flynn. And it was specifically Joe Pienka was tasked with that. But let's not forget that there were two other people with him. <laughs> the usual suspects. Kevin Kleinsmith, who's already got a lot of problems. Kevin Kleinsmith, Peter's been stroking us, and Joe Pienka were the three agents who were in that briefing. Now keep in mind, this is the type of briefing that they're supposed to be getting. Uh, and what they should have gotten in that briefing was something like, hey, be careful. We think the Russians might be trying to you know, infiltrate your campaign. Uh, they may be trying to infiltrate people in your campaign. Be very careful uh, about those sorts of things. Keep your eyes out uh, for this type of activity. That would have been a counterintelligence briefing. Watch out. Danger lurking around. That's what a counterintelligence briefing is about. But that's not what this was. This was just another attempt by the CrossFit fire hurricane team to uh, set up Trump. And this time specifically they were focused on Flynn, Michael Flynn. This will probably be another piece of evidence that will be sent over to Sidney Powell and will be forwarded to Judge Sullivan. 
And when did this occur? This occurred two days after Peter's been stroking us and loose Lisa Page talked about the insurance policy. The insurance policy. Two days later, they're in this, this what was supposed to be a counterintelligence briefing, which actually was not a counterintelligence briefing. It was Flynn, I mean, it was uh, Klein Smith, Peter's been stroking us, and Joe Pienka trying to get information they could use uh, to help them set up Flynn. There you go. That's a pretty damning document right there. Pretty damning document. To go along with all the others, <clears throat> something tells me Joe Pienka, who I believe is still at the FBI, <clears throat> is probably uh, one of those guys copying a plea deal. And he knows a lot of things. Now, let's get back to where we left off yesterday. We were going through the sources, the so-called sources, if you believe there were actually sources. The uh, so-called sources. Now, we left off at source number three. Source number three. <clears throat> Source number three we've all already identified as a woman. She is a Russian who regularly visits the United States. And when she does, she stays with <laughs> the um, primary subsource, Danchenko, or who we believe is Danchenko. The primary subsource says he often has had to help out source three financially. The primary subsource told the FBI that when talking about Trump, his source number three would talk about a private subject. Oddly enough, the FBI interviewers, Alton and Soma, were not the least bit interested in hearing about this private subject, not even curious. The primary uh, subsource and his source talked about this uh, private subject, but again, the FBI interviewers didn't seem to have any interest whatsoever in asking a follow-up question. Uh, so, like, tell me about this private subject regarding Trump with your subsource, your source. Didn't even ask the question. I mean, the primary subsource is telling the FBI, yeah, she was wanting to talk about something uh, involving Trump in uh, some private subject. That's what she wanted to talk about. And they're like, oh, that's interesting. What else you got? <laughs> man, oh man. Now, Christopher Steele <clears throat> had initially asked his primary subsource to get dirt on five people connected to Trump. The primary subsource told the FBI that by the time he got around to working on the issue, he had forgotten two of the five names that uh, Steele asked him to look into. <laughs> I don't think he was very interested in this case. What do you think? Yeah, Steele calls him and says, yeah, here's five people I want you to look into. He's like, okay, God. And then when he gets around to it and he goes to look into the five people, he forgets the names of two of them. Guess he didn't write it down. He's all over it. But he did remember Carter Page, Paul Manafort, and Michael Cohen. So the primary subsource asked his source number three about them. And initially, source three told him she didn't know anything about them at first. But then, within a few minutes, she suddenly recalled hearing something about Michael Cohen. <laughs> then it all came back to her. She heard that Cohen and three of his henchmen had gone to Prague to meet with Russians. Source three then began spinning yarns about Michael Cohen in Prague. She claimed that Cohen was delivering deniable cash payments to the DNC hackers. But the primary subsource tells the FBI that, come to think of it, I'm not really sure if Source 3 was brainstorming or what. <laughs> God. But somehow, the dossier, based on this bullshit brainstorming session, would somehow morph itself into an authoritative sounding reports of hackers who had been recruited under duress by the FSB, the new version of the old KGB, and how they had been using botnets and porn traffic to transmit viruses, plant bugs, steal data, and conduct altering operations. 
against the demo commie party. Now, when the FBI asked about the specifics of the altering operations, the primary subsource said, well, he wouldn't be much help there because he has zero understanding of this topic. <laughs> Nor is his Russian girlfriend, drinking buddy, uh, an IT specialist or very computer savvy or IT savvy. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. So what happened there <clears throat> with the uh, Michael Cohen thing is that, uh, as we know, this is all bullshit, right? What actually happened with Michael Cohen, I do believe, and I think Sundance nailed this a long time ago, is that obviously Nellie Orr is sitting there doing open source research and she stumbles onto the name Michael Cohen. There's probably thousands of Michael Cohens. She stumbles onto a Michael Cohen who made a trip to Prague. Now, as it turns out, this Michael Cohen turns out to be an art dealer who was over in Prague looking to buy or sell some art. Michael Cohen, as we now know, uh, had never been to Prague, never been anywhere near Prague or the Czech Republic, and his uh, passport proves it. So how did this story make it to Christopher Steele? Why is the primary subsource attributing it to his source? Well, because it's all made up and it's all bullshit. As I told you, the information was not coming from this primary subsource. This is all cooked up, made up. It's, it's a hoax. There was no primary subsource other than Glenn Simpson, Nellie Orr, Blumenthal, Shearer, probably Podesta, Slick Willie, the Rotten Reverend, maybe Mook, and of course, probably uh, some of those folks over there at Brookings, led by Strobe Talbot. Maybe Sharamella cooked this one up. Maybe, uh, what's her name? Hill, Fiona Hill. That's what I think. Yep, they, go they uh, did some um, 702 queries. The name Michael Cohen came back. They said, ha-ha, we got it, Michael Cohen. Not thinking that there might be a thousand Michael Cohens, maybe a million for all we know. It's a popular name. And they just assumed that that was Michael Cohen, Trump's lawyer, friend. Ex-friend, I guess you'd say. And uh, that's how Michael Cohen and this crazy story ended up here. Someone did a 702 query, saw it, passed it on, probably Nelly, probably gave it to Simpson. Simpson probably fed it to Steele, and Steele put it in his dossier. So, as you can see, as they're going through the interview with this guy and his lawyer, uh, what they want him to respond to are the accusations made in the dossier. And as you can see, uh, what he does is he responds, but he provides answers which cannot be verified at all. You see what I mean? They can't be caught creating the bullshit because it can't be verified. It can't be verified to prove it's true, but it can also not be verified to prove it's untrue. It, there's just nothing you can do. It's a primary, so-called primary subsource, talking about a drinking buddy in Russia, this woman, drinking buddy of his. What are they going to do, go to Russia and question her? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think the FBI is going to be able to go to Russia and question this Russian woman. And if they did, she wouldn't have much to say. And uh, do you think that she would reveal any source of this information? Of course not. If she would have, she would have given it to the primary subsource. Do any of the primary subsource's sources ever provide him with their, with their source? No, they do not. And this guy's supposed to be a professional, uh, you know, intelligence expert, business intelligence expert. But regardless of what type of intelligence expert you are, when someone tells you something, wow, where did you hear that? Well, so and so told me. Where, where did they hear it? Where did they get that? You're going to get to the bottom line source. That's what anybody would do. A first year police officer, a seasoned detective, uh, an intelligence analyst, a sheriff, your next door neighbor, you, your lawnmower gets stolen out of the garage. You start asking questions. You're going to get to the bottom of it. Primary subsource is never interested in getting to the bottom of it. He talks to his five drinking buddies, they give him a line of bullshit, and he feeds it back to Steele. And Steele puts it in his report. That's what we're told we have to believe, that how this came about. Christopher Steele is going to take information that he can't verify and doesn't attempt to verify. He's going to trust this primary subsource who has sources 
who are giving him information which he can't verify, nor can they. Everybody's running with information that no one can verify. Not even Steele or his primary subsource or any serious person would, 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 would do something like this. This is total bullshit. You see what I mean when I say it's bullshit? This is not believable. Nobody is this stupid, okay? Steele's a former professional intelligence officer. This guy has been working for Orbis, has obviously posted many reports. I mean, this is not a guy who's that stupid, who's going to think this would fly. This has to be a full setup. And the reason you know it's a setup is because they made sure that none of this could be verified. Either way. Not to verify it uh, so that it could actually be, you know, legitimate intelligence information or, le or legitimate sourcing. But more importantly, it cannot be proven so that you can't disprove that Steele had a primary subsource who had sources. Only common sense tells me that there was no such thing as a primary subsource or a guy with who we describe as a primary subsource with five sources. This is all bullshit. But they had to come up with something. I mean, what's still going to say? No, actually, I didn't have... Well, actually, it was just Glenn Simpson and Nellie Orr and uh, Cody Shearer and Blumenthal and some folks over there at Brookings feeding stuff to Steele, feeding, it, uh, feeding stuff to Simpson, feeding it to me. I copy and paste jobbed it, put it in my own uh, writing, put it in my own words, did mix it around a little bit, threw in a little bit of my own, a few of my own zingers, and uh, copy and pasted some stuff from some old reports I did, and then I shipped it back to Simpson. No, I don't think he's going to say that because he'd be in a hell of a lot of trouble. This guy just keeps on lying. Everybody's lying and hoping everyone else keeps on lying. I'm telling you what, eventually <laughs> their luck's going to run out. Their luck's going to run out. <laughs> These people got themselves so deep in this scam. And then Trump won the election and they got desperate. And they did a lot of things that were quite stupid. And now we know why they have gone and continue to go to the links that they're going to and went to. You would too if you tried to run a silly game like this on somebody. You know, Durham's got to be laughing at this shit. Durham and Jeff Jensen and... By the way, it was Jeff Jensen who uh, discovered those Strzok notes. By the way. That's a good man right there. I'm glad he's on the team. These guys got to be laughing their ass off right now. Durham and these guys investigating this, they have to be like rolling on the floor. They can't believe what they're actually investigating. What a freak show this is. How incompetent these people were. And corrupt. Now, probably the most uh, interesting uh, of the bullshit sources <clears throat> for the so-called primary subsource, which doesn't actually exist, uh, is this source number six. This is absolutely the best right here. This is, this is, as bad as all the rest of them are, this one makes them look solid. Source number six. <clears throat> so, source number six <clears throat> comes about the following way. The subsource, the primary subsource, meets a U.S. journalist while doing research on Manafort, which we now know was a couple of Google searches. They met at a Thai restaurant. The subsource asked the journalist what he knows about Manafort. By the way, who do you think the journalist was? Boy, I'd love to take a shot at that one. I'm thinking like, David Korn? Anyway, the subsource asked this journalist at this Thai restaurant what he knows about Manafort, or Trump Manafort, or Trump and Russia. The journalist tells the primary subsource that he doesn't know really anything, but uh, he can put him in contact with a colleague journalist, another journalist, who can put him in contact with someone he should talk to. So the primary subsource emails um, this journalist gets in contact with him. Journalist gives him this contact number, this email. And so the primary subsource, who we're just going to refer to as the guy, who later ends up being subsource or source six. So 
after he talks to this journalist, the second journalist, and the journalist says, yeah, well, here's an email. You know, you can email this guy. He, he might be able to give you some information. Then it wasn't until weeks later, in late June or July of 2016, some weeks later, the primary subsource receives a phone call from an unidentified Russian guy. He thought. But he had no evidence the mystery Russian was that guy. The mystery caller never identified himself, but the primary subsource went ahead and named the mystery caller source number six. <laughs> anyway, the primary subsource and the Russian guy talked for about 10 minutes. They arranged a future meeting, but when the day came for the meeting, the mystery caller failed to show up to the meeting. So the primary subsource went ahead and gave Steele the rundown on their brief conversation about Trump and the Kremlin. And uh, of course, this in this conversation, this um, Russian guy, so-called Russian guy, uh, said that um, Trump had an ongoing relationship with the Kremlin. Steele then named the source, Source E, and put him in the dossier. <laughs> I shit you not, my friends. That was, that's source number six. Steele's primary subsource is eating uh, lunch with a, with a friend at a Thai restaurant, journalist. Says, yeah, know anything about Manafort? No, not really, but I got a friend who might. He's a journalist too. Here, give him a call. Calls this uh, journalist, asks him if he knows anything about uh, Trump, Manafort, Russia. Hmm, not really, but here's a, email this guy. He might be able to know something. Primary subsource emails this, this, this Russian guy. Or we assume he's a Russian guy. They're telling us he's a Russian guy. Here's nothing for weeks. Then all of a sudden, one day, he gets an anonymous phone call, a mystery caller, a guy who sounds Russian. Doesn't ever identify himself one way or another as Russian or anything else, but he sounds Russian. And uh, the guy uh, start. they have a 10-minute conversation. He talks about the fact that Trump's somehow involved with the Kremlin. Fails to show up to a, a future meeting, what they said. At which point, the primary subsource says, well, it's good enough for me. <laughs> Sends it on over to Steele, and Steele calls it Source 6. Clearly, they were desperate to come up with some sort of a story. They had to come up with something because they had already been saying for several years, including Steele talking about it in various depositions, making up all kinds of stories about collectors and intermediaries and sources. Then when that didn't pan out, uh, and he couldn't prove any of that, and he wouldn't talk about any of that in the two previous lawsuits he was in where he gave depositions. He would never uh, give up that information. It's because there were no intermediaries, collectors, or subsources. But now things get really bad. Trump wins the election. It's January 2017, and they are in a world of shit. they got to find some way to cover their ass. Steele's been out there for a couple of years talking about collectors and subsources and sources. So what they got to do? they got to make some up. <laughs> and this is what they came up with. And where did they recruit the actors? Well, apparently they recruited the main actor in this little uh, plot from um, their good friends over there at the Brookings Institution, who were probably running this plot anyway, along with Glenn Simpson and the Rotten Reverend. That's all her friends over there at Brookings. They cooked this plot up, and they got themselves uh, in a lot of trouble. Because now they're going to have to try to back up all the bullshit that they and Steele had been talking I mean, what was still going to do at this point? Say, you know what? I lied. I really didn't have any collectors, intermediaries, or sources. I didn't have any subsources. It wasn't a primary subsource. It was just me. And uh, they were feeding me shit from, uh, you know, Clinton's people. Just feeding me shit through Simpson. That's what it was. Yep, I lied. Handcuff me. I don't think so. This guy's a professional liar. He's a former spook. He's not a very good liar unless you're stupid, which I'm not. So, there we go. There is the entirety for the last three videos. You now know about the so-called primary subsource and the subsources, uh, the sources for the primary subsource. And I think if you paid close attention, you can probably conclude what I have, which is this entire thing is bullshit. <laughs> it's all a fairy tale. <laughs> Where do we get the real truth? Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll be back tomorrow with more Tower Gate. See you. Bye.